Welcome everyone to the joint MPI workshop, probing the frontiers and measuring poverty from a multidimensional perspective. I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, at the George Washington University in Washington, DC, and moderator of today's event. Sensitivity Analyses in Poverty Measurement, the case of the global MPI measure presented by Nikolai Supa of Barcelona and Oxford with discussion by Monica Pineya Roncancio of Oxford and Suman Seth of Leeds. This is the first in the series of joint workshops co-sponsored by IIEP and its two partners, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, in the Department of International Development of Oxford University, and the Human Development Report Office, or HDRO, of the United Nations Development Program. I'd like to express my appreciation to Pedro Conceixao, the director of HDRO, and to Sabina Alkair, the director of OFI, for making this series possible. And to the many academics and practitioners who use the multidimensional technology upon which it is based, and are the key players in moving the frontiers forward, both in theory and in practice. I'd also like to thank IIEP's many supporters over the years, and especially its new leadership group, the IIEP Executive Circle. Now, for those of you who've never attended one of our events, either online or in person here in the Elliott School of International Affairs, you can expect an informative, nonpartisan exchange of views on many different topics, including digital trade, ultra poverty, global governance, and US-China economic relations. Last week, our China conference series continued with a conversation with Mike Lampton of Johns Hopkins, who provided a sobering account of the deteriorating conditions of US-China relations. This Friday, our Envisioning India series will feature Vijay Kalkar, architect of the Goods and Services Tax, or GST, system in India, who will provide a diagnosis of India's recent slowdown in economic activity. The following week, our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series brings Oxford once again to DC, when Sir David Hendry of Nuffield College and Dr. Jennifer Castle of Maudlin join us for an amazingly clear and important presentation taking stock of climate change, earth, air, fire, and water. If you miss any of our events, you can watch them asynchronously on our YouTube channel, IIEPGW. This includes the present event, present event and uh, the event we had last month on multidimensional poverty in the US and other advanced economies. Now, since I share some responsibility for developing these measurement tools, I'll take just a few moments to discuss the Alkire Foster method and explain why we think the technology is so useful. Then I don't think you'll hear from Sabina. You were expected to. Her connection is not making it from Bhutan. But hopefully later on in the presentation, you will hear from Sabina, who will add her perspectives uh, in between. First, uh, let me begin by asking a question. Why not just use monetary uh, poverty? Well, not all things people value have a dollar price. Other inputs might be required like time and social investments. This is most clearly seen in Sen's rightly famous capability approach and its view of poverty as capability deprivation across multiple de dimensions. To be sure, if all the dimensions of achievement could be meaningfully combined in some way analogous to how food and non-food expenditure add up to total expenditure, then we could simply apply a traditional unidimensional approach. No need to use multidimensional measurement here. But if dimensions cannot be meaningfully combined, you must employ a multidimensional approach to measuring poverty. Now, how do you do this? The Alkai Foster approach has an identification step indicating who is poor and an aggregation step evaluating overall poverty. The identification step starts by using cutoffs to determine if a person is deprived in a given dimension or indicator. It then uses normative weights or values, one per indicator to get an overall deprivation score for each person. If the score is large enough, so the person is multiply deprived enough, 
then the person is identified as poor. If not, then the person is non-poor and their score is rightly set to zero. For the aggregation step, we average the scores across all people in society to get the adjusted headcount ratio or MPI. You obtain the same number if you start with the poverty rate or headcount ratio and adjust it by the average deprivation score of the poor. In other words, the MPI is the incidence times the intensity of poverty. Now, who calibrates the measure by selecting indicators, cutoffs, and weights? For national measures, the parameters are typically chosen by a committee that constitutes, you know, the various stakeholders making choices that reflect the country's own values and aspirations. For international measures, such as the global MPI, parameters are often tied to international targets. In the case of the global MPI, it was the MDGs that were used. And this will be discussed, of course, in today's paper. What are the practical benefits of the FCAR Foster approach to multidimensional poverty? First of all, it can be used with all kinds of data, the kinds of data that you find typically available for multidimensional analyses, including ordinal variables or even categorical variables. And the overall measure can be broken down by region and dimension to facilitate poverty analysis and target the right population in the right dimensions. This facilitates coordination as the many stakeholders in each dimension are brought together to achieve the overall goal of lowering poverty. And it achieves good governance since unlike income poverty, the actions taken by governments in the various dimensions are often visible within political timeframes, allowing responsive governments to be appropriately rewarded for their efforts. Who uses the approach? The UNDP, the World Bank, and 30 or so countries, including Pakistan, India, most of Latin America, and parts of Africa. In today's talk, we'll be examining the sensitivity of the global MPI to changes in the various parameters underlying the calibration. And it was at this point that I was to turn the mic over to Sabina Alkair, but she's having connection issues from Bhutan. So let me take it over Thanks. and say, yes. Actually, Sabina has been able to join us. Fantastic. That's a wonderful thing. Great. <laughs> then let me at this point turn it over to my colleague and co-author, Dr. Sabina Alkair, who is joining us from Bhutan. She needs no further introduction. I will simply turn it over to you. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you so much, James. Um, and it's a delight for us at OFI to co-host this seminar series. And we really look forward to interaction over the next eight um, Eight week seminars, as, as James said, comprise different papers that are using the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index and analyzing it in a variety of different ways. And I'm delighted that this is the opening paper um, to be presented by Nikolai Supa which is looking at the sensitivity of the measure to different uh, adjustments in the parameters. Uh, and Nikolai did his doctorate in Dortmund, is the editor of the OFI working paper series, but most importantly, he is co-leading the estimations of the global MPI. And in particular, Nikolai has had a masterful role in creating a set of STATA programs um, by which we are able to run the MPI and all of the components, all of the divisions um, in a consistent, coherent and rapid manner, um, which is really a, a leap forward in terms of our internal processes. His clarity of thought, his patience, his diligence um, and leadership are, are very much appreciated, as I think that you will say, see during the seminar. The discussants are two, um, Dr. Shuman Chet and Dr. Monica Padilla. Shuman, um, did his doctorate with James Foster in Vanderbilt. He was also um, a senior research officer at OFI. Um, now he is a professor at Leeds University. And Schumann has always had a very strong theoretical approach, looking at the robustness of the Human Development Index, looking at um, different aspects of multidimensional poverty measurement, um, and also had an empirical 
um, side to his analyses, looking at growth, and he'll be presenting a paper on the elasticity of growth in India, um, also inequality among the poor. So we're delighted that Schumann is a discussant for this paper because it really is going into a field where he has had a, a leading voice. Dr. Monica Pnia um, did her doctorate in social policy and uh, is leading the outreach work with governments for OFI, um, looking at governments designing official national MPIs. She also led the work on changes over time um, in the global MPI. And again, that work is going to be presented next week. Um, Monica's doctoral interests have been on disability. Um, and she also then is very interested in uh, measures and their different kinds of relevance and their different kinds of adjustments. Um, that can make them accurate or perhaps a little bit less accurate. So we're really looking forward to the different angles and perspectives of the discussants. And most of all, to you, the listeners, to your inputs, to your reflections, as all of the work throughout the eight weeks is work in progress. And we are hoping through the seminar series to improve it, to get new ideas, to learn from your work. So thank you once again, and back to you, James. Uh -oh. It's up to you, Nikolai. Sure, then. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to present our uh, recent work in this seminar. Um, so now let me share my slides. Um, then we can start. So, um, this is joint work uh, with Sabina, with uh, Usha Kanagaratnam, who is also uh, co-leader of the Global MPI estimations, and Ricardo Nogales, who is also a research officer at, uh, at OFI. Uh, and indeed, this topic uh, or this presentation is about the is, uh, offers a sensitivity analysis of the Global MPI, but also relates more generally speaking uh, to uh, how should we conceive or think about sensitivity in poverty measurement. Uh, the outline of the talk is uh, straightforward, so I will give a little bit of background information um, to situate the debate, then introduce quickly the global MPI. Um, then I will also talk a little bit about conceptual considerations, uh, which relate to Zen's work and how should we think about uh, poverty measurement uh, in, in which framework and uh, on sensitivity. And finally, I will present you a selection of results, not all of them in detail, but uh, um, just a few highlights. Um, so let me quickly provide you with some background. Uh, Zen and others wrote repeatedly and argued repeatedly that poverty measurement entails value judgments. So by now, I think that's pretty much clear. But these value judgments enter poverty measures in different ways. On the one hand, we have the axioms, which are desirable properties of a measure. We have, of course, also the underlying wealth variables, which could, which could be income consumption or the dimensions of human well-being themselves. And then we also have the all kinds of parameters which have to be chosen. And these parameters vary a bit with the kind of poverty measure that you're using. So you usually have a poverty cutoff in monetary measures. You have equivalent scales. You have price indices, purchasing power parities. In our case of multidimensional measures, we, we're talking about deprivation cutoffs uh, and weighting schemes of the different indicators or dimensions. And usually it's uh, this last uh, point, so the parametric values, that frequently attract lots of criticism and worries and concern. And this is not limited to the global MPI. This is, in fact, more general. Uh, in case of the World Bank, uh, World Bank's dollar a day measure, for example, the critics questioned, uh, among other things, the estimation procedures for the poverty line or the purchasing power parities. And th this has been, there has been quite a debate around that. And in a similar way, uh, our global MPI was also criticized from various directions with respect to the parametric decisions in particular. And back in 2010, it was particular the, the chosen weights, which attracted lots of crit criticism, but also still the poverty cutoff or the indicator selection. So the question is how to handle that, of course. I mean, there is a degree of arbitrariness in that, even though I would argue it's not completely arbitrary. And the idea is how do, we de how do we deal with that? And one line of research was exploring or is exploring uh, the so-called or the dominance analysis. And the idea is here to come up with results or conclusions that are independent of a particular parameter choice. Well, they hold for all the different possible parametric choices like the poverty cutoff, for example. And this has been applied to both monetary and multidimensional poverty measurement. This is one way to address the, the need for a choice of par parameters. However, 
The problem is the dominance results may not emerge. And the problem with that is then we leave policy at, uh, policymakers without counsel and without uh, advice. Another limitation is even if we find some, some dominant uh, 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 result, it's not clear to which extent uh, there is a big difference uh, between, the, between, say, two countries, or it's very tiny. So this, these are some limitations. And another way are sensitivity analysis to, to, to study uh, the, the, the implications of parameter changes. And in fact, we are not, it's like this, this doesn't come at a surprise. Uh, this has been used in many, many ways. Parameter outcome combinations have been studied uh, from, from the inception. And very different outcomes have been studied. Uh, I would say not like super systematically, but like uh, we, uh, the, the, the headcount ratio has been studied. So the different FGT measures, the gap has been studied, the square back, uh, squared gap, to which extent parameter um, changes would affect those uh, indices or the number of the poor implied by a particular measure. How does that change with a parametric uh, variation or subnational rankings or time trends? So there is a lot to study. Um, and by now, it's also pretty clear why we need this kind of information because it's well policy implications. If uh, our results are sensitive to that, we may have different policy implications. So we have to know uh, have to know that. But it also matters for targeting, resource allocation, but also the credibility of the measure. Um, that's a quick background. So what are we doing in this paper here? So one bit is we provide a conceptual integration to a social choice framework. And why do we do that? Well, on the, on the one, or what do we do here? We try to detail the role of sensitivity analysis and poverty measurement, which might be a bit different from what we're used to think of in say econometrics, for example. Um, but it also helps us actually in the interpretation of the empirical evidence. Uh, when is sensitivity a problem and when maybe not? So and we, are, we are looking for, uh, yes, the, the conceptual social uh, uh, choice framework provides us some context here. And then uh, we also offer uh, action, the, the empirical analysis, uh, an extensive uh, sensitivity analysis of the global MPI. And in particular, we focus on two outcomes, which are poverty sets. So the, uh, the people who are identified as poor and so the subnational ranking, that's the, currently the focus. And uh, many of these uh, outcomes have been uh, studied previously, but poverty sets have been mostly uh, analyzed in the context of comparing entirely different measures. So, for example, monetary and multidimensional, but not so much in sensitivity analysis of multidimensional themselves or monetary uh, among themselves. And also, we focus here uh, on subnational rankings, where previous research was mostly uh, analyzing international rankings or orderings, if you want. Uh, then we also uh, perform well, we assess the robustness of different parameters. We focus here on the poverty cutoff. Uh, most extensively on the weights, which attracted lots of criticism, but we also consider something that has been not studied that much, namely the indicator omission or inclusion. Um, the, uh, I mean, a little bit indicator definitions have been studied, uh, the sensitivity with respect to indicator definition has been studied, but not that extensively. And then we also aim to explore the role or the usability of plausible parameter ranges as a kind of middle ground between select a few selected values and the entire range of possible values. And another bit related to uh, uh, this work is a second order sensitivity analysis. What does that mean? Well, whenever we vary one parameter, we may find uh, sensitivity or not, but that is that could actually be conditional on some third parameter parametric choice. And for example, this is the case we study, the sensitivity to indicator selection may actually depend on the choice of the poverty cutoff. And we are trying to make the point that that uh, is often the case. Um, and it allows us to come up with some kind of methodological conclusions. Um, and we also have a tiny shift in perspective from kind of, uh, but this is closely related to some of the method, methods that we don't seek. We're not seeking for comprehensive robustness assessments, but rather we are trying to study at which incremental change do we uh, observe significant variation in the outcomes. So let me quickly come to the global MPI. Uh, uh, this paper uses the, not the latest release, uh, it uses the 2019 release of the global MPI. We are covering over 100 countries with 1,226 in subnational regions. Subnational results are available for almost 100 countries due to survey constraints. 
We cannot cover all of them. The underlying micro data is uh, mostly DHS and mix, but in some cases also PAPFAM or national service. We cover approximately a 10, a 10 year period. The sample size varies quite a bit. Uh, the median sample size is around 50,000 50, observations. If you're interested in replicating any of them, the deprivation or the data prep, two files which cover the deprivation indicator constructions, they're all available for all of the releases and all of the countries, or for the latest releases at least. So now here, what is the global MPI? So we use, as James just uh, introduced, uh, we use the dual cutoff counting approach uh, suggested by Sabina and James. Um, and we rely on 10 indicators with the global MPI. You see them depicted below. Uh, and this indicator construction is informed by MDGs and SDG considerations. Uh, we apply here an equal nested weighting scheme, which means one third to each dimension. And within dimension, all indicators receive equal weight. That means living standard indicators on the right receive less weight than education or health indicators themselves. Um, then we have a, as, as a critical para parameter, uh, the, the cross-dimensional poverty cutoff. And here the, dep or the weighted deprivation count. And here we apply or re we require one third of uh, the way of possible weighted deprivations to be present in order to be considered poor. And then we, we study three main figures. Uh, one is the simple headcount ratio, which is a sub-index for our measure. The uh, and the, the second is the intensity, which is the average deprivation among the poor. And the MPI itself, or the adjusted headcount ratio, is the product of the two. So this is uh, a rough layout of the global MPI. So what do we do in terms of parameter variation? So to give you a sense, what kind of numbers we have been analyzing. For the poverty cutoff, which has been studied before also relatively extensively, we consider 10 distinct values, including the uh, extreme cases of union, meaning that any deprivation renders an individual poor and intersection approach, which requires a household to suffer from all possible deprivations at the same time. Otherwise, uh, only then they will be considered poor. And we consider the plausible range, which, ha which has been argued in previous research to be between 20 and 50% uh, uh, of the deprivation count. Uh, this can be motivated by different uh, lines of reasoning. I won't go into detail here. Then for weighting schemes, previous research focused essentially on picking two or three particular interesting weighting schemes. What we are doing here is a more systematic analysis. We are studying 231 weighting schemes and we construct them in a way that for each dimension, uh, we, uh, we allow the, with the weight range from zero to 100%. So we're talking about dimensions, not indicators here, uh, in five percentage points. Uh, and we also have, of course, our reference specification, which is a third to each dimension. And then what we consider here to be a plausible range is uh, all weighting schemes or structures that have a dimensional weight between 25 and 50. Again, there is reasoning behind that. And one argument could be that you need additional strong arguments if you wanted to assign more than half of the uh, of the weight to a single uh, dimension. That means health, for example, why should that be more than half of the entire weight or more than uh, living standard and education together? Uh, the indicator selection, we are, we are starting here with a kind of tiny mod modification only. Uh, we consider six alternative diff, uh, indicator selections where we drop each, where we drop one living standard indicator at a time. So we have six different specifications because, of course, there are so many possibilities. We have to choose something that is still feasible. On the other hand, or additionally, we also study the weighting schemes in extreme cases. Namely, we assign 100% to one dimension which essentially means we drop the other two. So this is a kind of the weighting schemes cover, therefore a kind of extreme uh, indicator selection as well. Um, and we, so we have two cases. One is we retain a single dimension and we also retain two dimensions and drop only one. So we have another, another additional six indicator selections in, implicitly by the weights. Now the conceptual considerations. Um, let me explain here. So, uh, so from the outset, it's clear that value judgments are part of that exercise of poverty measurement. There is no escape to that. And Zen made that clear in, in very different occasions. Um, 
Uh, and one is, for example, in the context of the capability approach uh, that we have uh, to discriminate between different dimensions. And that, this, that is nothing too unique to the capability approach. Rather, it's a common feature of poverty measurement. The question is, what does that mean for poverty measurement for us? And then, the, so how shall we proceed? And Zen provides a, a good advice on many things and uh, on this uh, in particular. Uh, and here you see a quote from Development as Freedom, uh, from the, in Development and Freedom. And here Zen comments on how he envisages to choose the weights in uh, poverty measures or well being measures. And first, he points out this is a judgmental exercise. So if we were individuals, that would be up to our reflection, and then we come up with a judgmental exercise. However, we're talking here about a social evaluation. We want to come up with a poverty measure for the society. So there is some need for some, well, we have to go through some reasoned consensus. And anticipating that we may not be able to agree on a specific value, uh, on specific values, a range, of, as a, a range of weights may do the job as well. And there is no need to, uh, to, to, to rely on a particular set. Um, and finally, I think the last sentence makes it very clear that this is a social choice exercise and this and additionally it requires public discussion. So it's not only about say majority voting, uh, one of the common topics in social choice, but it also has the reason, argue, the, the reason element. So there is public discussion needed in order to, to identify those value ranges. So how could that look like? Imagine the social, this is the social choice out, well, kind of a social choice exercise you want. And usually we would have something like the well-being seek, the, an order of well-being of the individuals. And we could say something like uh, uh, individual I is doing as well as two, and they are do both doing better than three and so on. So this is the way what we could envisage in terms of uh, the social choice exercise. The problem is this is uh, really, strong simplification because the actual uh, actual outcome looks more complicated. One of the complications is there may not even be, uh, uh, or the result might be even a partial ordering, meaning that some of these relations, we have simply no clue whether say seven, uh, individual seven and eight, who is worse off or whether they're equally bad off, uh, we simply cannot say, even though we may agree that those two are the worst off of all of them. So there are additional complications which we uh, would have to consider. But what does that mean for our work on, poverty, on specifying poverty measures? Well, we can consider or try to consider these value judgments which are held in the society, held in the society as a factum for our research. And there is one quote uh, from 1979, uh, the Scandinavian Journal of Economics, I think. Uh, the idea was here of Zen. Well, or this, it says to describe a prevailing prescription is an act of description, not prescription well, itself. So the idea is we can view that uh, our, our task in translating social value judgments, which we kind of try to reveal and infer through public debates into parametric choices. Now, normative decisions and poverty measurement. So, so, so this is the, on a theoretical level. However, when we specify a measure, things get even more complicated in practice. Um, so this is one ingredient that we have to consider, but there are more when we specify a measure. Because in order to obtain a fully functional measure, we also need to balance information from different sources. This is discussed in the, in the textbook uh, in detail, but the value judgment on what constitutes poverty and deprivation is one part of it. But there are other considerations that we have to take into account, including data availability and quality, domain specific expertise, e.g. on nutrition or child development and policy relevance, because ultimately we want to provide a useful measure to policymakers. Uh, and ideally, these normative decisions are reached in a transparent way. We have public discussion with all the stakeholders. Uh, um, uh, so that will be the way to proceed. And here, the public debate on that has, has both. It's not only legitimating, a legitimating role for the measure, but it's also a constructive one, partly in revealing the, 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 the social order, uh, ordering, if you want, and partly uh, in uh, identifying and uh, balancing the different needs. What does all that mean for sensitivity analysis? Well, in econometrics, it's more or less clear to give a contrast. You have a claim for a certain effect, and if you vary your assumptions and the effect disappears, you usually have a problem because your effect is no longer there and it will be hard to argue uh, for you or to, to convince people of your result. In measurement, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's simplification. So I could add nuances to that. Uh, in measurement, things are a bit more complex for different reasons. So of course, on the one hand, we want robust results. And this bit is important to understand these four points. We want robust results, which makes things easier to, our, to provide advice to policymakers, right? Because we have similar policy implications. Um, then um, non-robustness, however, does not disqualify a measure automatically because it can be the result of a particular value uh, judgment that is embedded in the social ordering. Then there is also the issue that it might reflect an uh, ambiguity, ambiguity uh, in, in, because there, are, there might be pairs that we cannot really um, order. And often we expect theoretically sensitivity. We would never claim that our measures should be insensitive to the entire value range, because actually this changes the nature of the measure. Um, and an important insight is that, or aspect is that knowledge of this uh, insensitivity can actually help to reach precisely the consensus on the, dis, uh, on the parameters. Because if it's easier to agree on a range rather than uh, on a specific set of values. Now let's come to the empirical analysis. Obviously, you may not be surprised that I will select results uh, heavily. Uh, you see a brief overview of what I will provide you. Uh, I don't talk in detail about, uh, I will skip this uh, uh, on, the, on the indices or sub-indices themselves. I will focus instead of on the sub-national rankings and the poverty sets. And even there, I'm sharing only with you a subset because we, we use different measures to uh, poverty sets, for example, um, and it's uh, simply too many results. Uh, mostly, I will focus all, also on the subnational rankings with respect to age, and that or age plays some role in, in, in the considerations here. But it's be to be clear, the MPI or M0 is the adjusted head ratio, so that's the poverty measure. Age is only a sub-index. But it matters, for example, because it's the size of the sets, and also by tendency, we find, it's more, we find that it's more sensitive. So this is a brief overview. Some background, this is this, uh, I, I select some of the countries for different reasons. And here you see uh, uh, um, Thailand, Algeria, India, up to Mozambique and Niger. And why, why, do, why did we choose these countries here? Well, the global MPI is a cross country measure. So it, we, 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 we're aiming for cross country comparisons. And, and that means uh, not necessarily these measures would, this measure would be a good national measure. Um, what we, so in, for example, in Thailand, to give you a sense of the numbers that we observe, the poverty headcount ratio is less, or the headcount ratio is less than 1%. In Algeria, it's 2%, whereas in Niger, it's around 90%. So the idea is that whenever you see these countries, they, they uh, refer to very different uh, conditions uh, or living conditions that people experience. And, and also the subnational regions vary quite. So the detail, what the survey allows us to analyze. Um, so this is just to keep in mind, and I'm selecting, because it matters, uh, the context matters for the interpretation of robustness. So then let me quickly show you uh, this one I would like to skip because this is about simple about simply about the headcount ratios. So let me quickly talk about how do we study subnational uh, rankings. So the question here is how does an incremental parameter change reshuffle this national ranking of a poverty measure or a sub-index? And we consider here some measure for or uh, uh, p theta and theta represents here one particular uh, parametric uh, uh, choice, and we have g uh, subnational units. Then we have we we always compare an alternative parametrization theta prime against a, uh, the reference parametrization, which, which is the one of the global MPI. And then for each of the for each regions within a for, for each region in a country, we for each pair of regions we can perform um, uh, a pairwise comparison, and we either conclude based on statistical tests that poverty is higher in G, they are both equal, or poverty is higher in H. And we run this very same exercise also for our alternative parametrization, theta prime. And then we are ending up with the share of robust pairwise comparisons, which is we simply count those orderings, if you want, uh, where both parametrizations conclude with the same ordering. And we put that sum relative to the possible uh, number of uh, pairwise comparisons. And that is the share of, so we call one of these um, 
if they come up with a sequence uh, uh, with the same ordering, we call that a, a robust pairwise comparisons, and the share is expressed uh, in terms of the possible relative to the possible um, share uh, pairwise comparisons. There are a couple of caveats. Uh, I don't explain them in detail, but rather um, I want to focus on some of the results here. You see India. I will first introduce the diagram and then show you more evidence for other countries. You see India, and we have here on the on the y-axis we have the share of robust pairwise comparisons. Uh, and that for both the headcount ratio, which is the blue line, and the red line, which is the MPI itself. Then we plot that against the poverty cutoff, and we see the poverty cutoff, the preferred specification here is the red line. And if you would compare it with itself, so to say, you, we have exactly the same um, ordering, so we have one. And then we start to move one by one and decrease the K uh, um, and we, we, we try to study uh, to which extent does, does this reshuffle the different uh, uh, the, the subnational ranking. And we see, for example, that the dashed lines here indicate uh, the reasonable range, the plausible range, and we see slight decreases if we move away from the preferred cutoff, but the really steep decrease is for very high values of K. So there it goes below 0.4, for example, and we also see that the the, the, the measure for H is declining faster than for uh, MPI itself. So how does that look in other countries? So here you have an overview, and you see broadly the same pattern in the sense that H tends to decline earlier. And second, that if we move further away from, um, from the preferred specification, it tends to decline, but not always. For example, in super or in very poor countries like Niger, it's even high for different, uh, for different uh, poverty cutoffs. And not all countries have this decline for, for very high values, but by tendency intersection, choosing an intersection approach, so a K of 100, really reshuffles the ranking. So that's one uh, uh, interesting observation. Uh, and then I'm always providing you these, these countries here. Again, the first line shows you for low poverty countries, then medium poverty countries, and the last line is for high poverty countries. Now, how do we study weights? Let me show you uh, this analysis for the weights. What does this diagram tell us? So on the, on the y-axis, we see the weight for health running from zero to 100%. On the x-axis, we see the weight for education from zero to 100. The third way is implied uh, by these uh, values. So each dot in this diagram represents one outcome for a specific uh, uh, weighting scheme. So you see 231 dots on this figure, and uh, the outcome plotted here is the share of robust pairwise comparisons for the headcount ratio. And then you see our preferred um, uh, uh, theta parametrization is here in the center, the, the black dot. And starting from here, we want to analyze the sensitivity of the, the, of the subnational rankings if we move further away from nested equal weights. And you see here, this, this dashed triangle, the contracted simplex, which tells us all those weighting schemes which, are, which we consider to be plausible. Um, and we see pretty much a, an obvious op uh, one observation here. Is there is a gradient that is more or less clear. If we move away from that scheme, uh, it tends to reshuffle the ranking a bit. Note that we observe here values of, of around 6.6, uh, for example. The interesting bit is we can compare to get an order of magnitude with the case. And here we, for example, see deeper drops for uh, uh, up to even 0.4, whereas for the entire range here, we, we are above 0.6. So this gives us a sense of magnitude, uh, even for the, those uh, extreme weighting schemes. Moving to all of the countries or more countries, we see broadly a similar pattern, which is not that surprising. But let me come to poverty sets. Here, the question is, we study the overlap of the poverty sets of what the different measures identify as poor, of whom they identify as poor, and we use different measures for this. One is the jacket coefficient, one is the redundancy measure. There are pros and cons of both, uh, and, but the main insights are similar. Uh, and the jacket here is, uh, is the intersection of both poverty sets. If you think in terms of Venn diagrams, that's helpful, relative to the union of both measures. This thing is exactly one only if they both, if they exactly coincide, but it will decrease either if the headcount changes for a different parametrization, shrinks or grows, or if the overlap decreases. In both cases, the jacket will fall. 
The question is, um, does it matter? And I'm trying to convince you it does matter. So the headcount is not telling us the full story in this of, on the poverty sets. Now, here, for example, you see on focus on the left panel, please. Here we see uh, the jacket coefficient plotted against the change of the headcount ratio. Whenever we change the headcount ratio, the jacket would change as well. So that's not a surprise. But uh, in particular, what we see here, each dot represents again a change in the headcount uh, in the in the jacket coefficient in the headcount for one particular weighting scheme. And we see that in particular on the vertical axis of zero, which means the headcount doesn't change for that particular weighting scheme if we play around with that, but the jacket coefficient, the overlap can drop and shrink. So this would go undetected if we don't consider it explicitly. Um, how does the analysis here look like? Well, in terms of weights, we see broadly the same pattern. We have a different value, so because we have a different outcome now, but we see a gradient that comes um, with, uh, with the weighting schemes. Um, to make a comprehensive analysis, we always need to know how the headcount changes in line with that. But I will skip that. Here's more the broad pattern. And you see again, in general, we observe the same gradient. However, there are big differences between the levels of between the countries. For example, for high poverty countries, we see, broadly speaking, more green than for low poverty countries, which is in the end not surprising because uh, the headcount is pretty large, so it's very hard not to overlap. It. On the other hand, interestingly, for remember, 1% headcount ratio or 2%, still within the small triangle, we have pretty much overlap within the plausible, uh, plausible weighting schemes. Let me come to quickly to the second uh, order sensitivity analysis. So what do we do here again? So here we focus now on the indicator selection uh, and we try to compare the sensitivity of, we start with a, with a change in the sample headcount uh, with respect to indicator selection. So we drop one living standard indicator at a time and we compare whether there is a difference in sensitivity conditional on the poverty uh, cutoff that we choose and we compare our preferred uh, value which is the one third cutoff on the right panel and we take the union uh, approach which is the one percent on the left now the interesting observation here is of course if we drop an indicator that affects the headcount ratio but uh, we see that for the for our preferred measure most of the changes happen between 10 percentage points plus minus of the preferred measure uh, the, the headcount change. However, what, what can happen for the union approach is that you end up with radically different headcount ratios, which can be a problem to communicate to the public. Imagine you cannot update an indicator, you have to drop it, and suddenly your headcount ratio drops to give an order of magnitude. The headcount ratio drops by 20 or 30 percentage points. That is a challenge to communicate. Um, so, but this we don't observe for the, for the, um, for the for our for our non-union cutoff for the preferred cutoff. An interesting observation, another one is that we can actually study also the subnational rankings with risk uh, in, in the in the in the same framework. And we see, ignore the colors please, uh, and we see here that um, on the left hand we have again the union case and we observe drops in the subnational in 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 the share of robust pairwise comparisons of down to 0.6 or even 0.4, and that across the board. It, it's not associated with a particular headcount ratio. Whereas in our preferred specification, there, there can be drops, but much less so. The question is, is that the same sign of the, uh, the, same sign of the finding that I showed you before? If we take a look at this one, this figure here, we see the change, on the the change of the headcount on the left and the share of pairwise robust comparisons on the x-axis. And we actually see if that was the same thing, then we would see them more or less on a diagonal line. However, we see actually th these are both, both in part independent problems of the union approach, if you want, because we see here at, with an RH value of one, we see actually the, 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 the subnational ranking doesn't change but, change, but we have substantive drops in the headcount ratio. And uh, conversely, in countries like Rwanda here, for example, Actually, it doesn't change the headcount ratio, but we have a substantial reshuffling of uh, the subnational ordering. So these are two different things, and we don't observe it uh, 
uh, in our preferred specification. So let me quickly pick two conclusions. Uh, I won't run through all of them. Um, one is, um, I think that we, what, we, what we see here is that indicator construction and selection uh, is something that has been neglected in academic research. In some sense, it's maybe less theoretically appealing than, for example, the problem of the weights. But according to our results, if we pair across parametric changes, this really matters. Uh, in, it's in the same league, more or less, I would say. So we should pay more academic attention to the indicator construction and selection. Uh, then there is the, the, the union cutoff comes potentially with indicator sensitivity, which is a drawback. And uh, just one, one sentence on, on the robustness findings of the global MPI. Broadly speaking, we see not that much sensitivity in the plausible range uh, of parameters. And on, uh, rather than just calculating the numbers and estimating the numbers, is there an explanation for that? Uh, and I would argue, actually, yes. So for, for many things, I don't find it that surprising that we find lots of insensitivity here. And why is that? Because in the end, we are focusing on multiple deprivation. This is our understanding of poverty that we implement with the global MPI and with a non-union cutoff. And the thing is, if you imagine, if you play around with the weights, even for the extreme weights, and in the end, you require multiple deprivation. So it cannot be something completely different. Of course, it can make a difference empirically, but it's not that suddenly completely different can be poor because you need multiple deprivation in the first place. Um, and then I would like to stop here and to give the, yeah, and I'm looking forward to the comments and discussion of um, uh, Monica and Schumer. Excellent. Thank you so much. It was most uh, informative and a heck of a lot of information in a short period of time, including all the different ways that sensitivity can be evaluated uh, in a, uh, in, for the global MPI. Uh, at this moment, if you're sitting in the audience and have questions starting to be put together in your head, please uh, uh, approach the Q&A uh, device on your uh, web page for WebEx and uh, start thinking about putting, putting in uh, the, um, that information. Right, so let us go with Monica for the first uh, discussion. Monica? It's yours. Oh, we seem to have temporarily lost Monica. Let's wait for just a second and uh, see if she uh, comes back. Otherwise, we'll go to Suman. Suman, are you about ready? Perfect. Okay, um, first of all, uh, I must thank Professor Foster, Sabin Alkar, uh, my uh, colleagues at OFI and IAP. Thank you very much for organizing this, and thank you so much for inviting me to discuss the paper. Um, so uh, first, let me switch this one off. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's a very interesting and uh, mostly a very rigorous robustness analysis compared to the existing paper. I mean, that's for sure. The amount of work that you have been put together, Nikolai and um, others, uh, it's great. It's great to see um, so much work, um, you know, with respect to alternative weights, poverty cutoffs, and indicators. Uh, I fully understand now that it is not a complete, complete piece of work. You are still writing, working on it, and of course, over time, the clarity will improve. Um, another thing probably would be quite important is to clarify the policy salience of the paper. Where do you want to sell it? How you want to sell it? Uh, it's a methodological tool that policy analysts also could be uh, able to use for their own purpose to improve, you know, policy uh, prescriptions. Now, what I will try to do, I will try to uh, point out, I know Monica will also provide some um, the empirical and applicable side of it. What I will try to do, I will try to um, provide some similarity with the existing um, literature and uh, that you could also link. And also some of my observations regarding some of the results that um, you just presented, Nikolai. Um, so first of all, the share of, share of pairwise comparison that you presented is uh, very much linked to uh, the Kendall Staus coefficient when um, there are no ties. And given that you are 
reporting the MPI figures and you know H figures with high decimals. I'm not going to expect uh, that much ties unless they're all zeros, which is quite unlikely for developing countries. Uh, then the Kendall Star coefficient should be just equal to uh, two times the pairwise comparisons minus one. And this is something we also showed clearly with a joint paper with uh, Professor Foster in um, 2030. Um, so there's a clear link. It would be good to point out that clear link. And also maybe in future to think of what something called this multidimensional concordance analysis, because this is nothing but uh, kind of concordance of rank. So whether we could have a way instead of plotting so many measures or average correlation, whether we could also report a measure we could, which could say, you know, this is the, this is a particular index of concordance of this overall ranking that may make it just like the MPI with, with one number to show, you know what, this can be reported by people as well to know how much robust it has been rather than uh, plotting so many numbers at the same time. Uh, a little bit on the set of alternative weights. Um, I know that uh, this weight variation of 0.25 and 0.5 has been used um, uh, quite uh, for quite some time. Um, there may be good value judgment, but it, it may be also considered a bit arbitrary. You may want to go uh, for other weights, for example, inside the, the, the triangle that you had drawn. Maybe you can you may want to do it for other weights. Maybe um, you may only want to set an upper bound because the lower bound will be automatically determined because uh, they all sum up to one. Or you just say, you know, weight should not be more than uh, this particular amount. And, and that's all. Uh, then the question is, what kind of weight set would that would may look like? You know, um, so we try to find uh, provide some results. It's an extension of uh, the work uh, that Professor Foster uh, and I, along with Mark McIlfrey, did uh, in 2009 and 2013, and just to show you how these different sets may look like. So on the left hand side, um, in figure A, for example, instead of uh, varying them between one fourth and half, which is 25% and 50%, I let them vary between one sixth and half. And it looked like you get something so-called, uh, Professor Foster used to teach us quite a lot, the like Combs triangle, okay? Where it is just the point of Lorentz curve, six, six points uh, of Lorentz curves where uh, the inequality is equal. So you get this hexagon. Whereas if you do, if you just say the lower bound and if you let the upper bound to vary, it doesn't matter what it is, you get this triangle, which eventually here coincides with your um, triangle uh, approach of 0.2 and 0.5. Whereas if you just said the upper bound, no lower bound at all, you get this inverted shape triangle. So why I wanted to show this to you is that in case somebody has good argument of setting these weight limits differently, and you may want to consider grids in that particular set, you need to understand how the set looks like. And some results already exist on how these different sets may look like. So you can create the grid within this particular set. The third key aspects where I wanted to sort of push you probably a bit is, um, yes, it's important. I mean, we are in the multidimensional world. And association or correlation between indicators, it's quite important. And we already have some results that shows that redundancy or robustness, you know, how much uh, uh, correlation you have between uh, indicators that may determine how robust comparisons are going to be. High association, high correlation is going to bring more robustness. You will get more correlation at the aggregate level and maybe also at the individual level. So one question that may arise are associations between indicators. They are stable across countries or across regions for the MPI indicator, the set of indicators that you are considering. Um, in the graph, you showed, for example, how, you know, when you are reducing the, uh, when you are reducing the poverty cutoff and you are going towards a more union approach, you saw more correlation with MPI, but slightly less correlation with H. However, when we are moving to the intersection approach, you see the correlation is changing 
along the same line. Now, this is because as you are increasing the cutoff, you are moving towards the intersection approach. And we know H and M0, they are going to be exactly the same for the intersection approach. So probably that is somehow determining that particular move, whereas for the EVN approach, the single indicators, this lack of correlation between indicators when blood deprived in one indicators and so on, that's probably is driving the, cor the correlation or the robustness a little bit. So maybe um, also at some point, maybe not in this paper, also for future food of thought, uh, trying to bring the idea of copulation, the copula and the association between indicators and so on to bring and sort of try to understand how they are also playing a role um, in your robustness. So these are some of the food for thoughts. I will uh, pause here and um, I will let the, let others ask questions and also if Monica is back to provide uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Suman. That was uh, incredibly rich and uh, really appreciate your looking through the results and relating them to the existing literature. Um, most clear, most uh, insightful. Now let's turn over to Monica, who is back with us. Monica. Thank you very much. And again, my apologies. My internet is tired to kick me off uh, of the call when I was saying um, starting my presentation. So um, I'm going to be brief. I, I just want to say thank you uh, for in, uh, inviting me here to give the comments on this uh, paper. It is a really important paper. And um, when you are creating a national MPI or you're working with governments, this becomes a really um, important aspect to always discuss with governments. And it becomes uh, important because the process of creating a national MPI, it will always be related to taking normative decisions. And those normative decisions are, regarded, are related to deciding the weights, deciding the indicators, the deprivation cutoffs, the poverty cutoffs. And these are decisions that are fundamental to define the structure of the measure. And depending on which of these decisions you take, you are going to have different types of measures and will have different types of population who are selected as a multidimensional group. In the, in the process of creating these national measures, then it becomes fundamental that we are completely sure that the people who are we are selecting are the people who are the most deprived in the society. And most important that when you change the measure, you are not just selecting different or random groups of population, but also that you are sure that the people who are there are the poorest. Uh, or are the people who really need it. So as uh, the, mentions, uh, the authors mentioned, these decisions become one of the biggest criticisms or criticism of the uh, Algaida Foster method, but also it becomes one of the biggest strengths if once you are able to um, argument that the decisions that you are taking are the right decisions, uh, the, the measure is, it becomes more transparent and it becomes more uh, valid and people accept the measure in a better way. Um, therefore, uh, one of the things that we always uh, recommend to the policy makers and to the governments who are working in national MPIs is to conduct a robustness on sustainability analysis in order that we are sure of what we are doing. And we always compute uh, three or four or five or more trail measures the ones differ depending on the type of indicators that are included and also the deprivation and poverty cutoffs. And one of the analysis that we always compute is to analyze what, how the poverty rate and the, uh, the incidence and the intensity change according to the different uh, deprivation, uh, poverty cutoffs. But also we play with the weights and we play uh, changing the way and assigning different weights to the different indicators as the authors present in the paper. It was really, really interesting and important to see what other types of analysis we can compute in order that we are completely sure and we understand what the measure is captured. So things like the jackal coefficient were really, like when I read the jackal coefficient, I was really happy to see this type of analysis because at the end, what we want to see is that at, uh, it doesn't matter the measure that you have, you, are, uh, you have a, a probability or you have a sense of what is the percentage of population that you are capturing inside the measure. And it's always important to see how the different, uh, the incidence of poverty change according to the different uh, decisions. For example, in the second order sensitivity analysis that you compute, 
to see how the different uh, deprivation of poverty could help will change if you take one or two indicators to change the weights of the of the different dimensions. As uh, the previous um, as once was mentioning, depending on the structure of the measure and this joint distribution and this association between the different indicators will be fundamental to understand what happened with the final measure. It's it, like uh, it's important to realize that or it's important to highlight that when we are analyzing a multidimensional property measure, we are not only analyzing that one indicator changes, but we are analyzing that the change in that indicator probably will increment the number of deprivations of the, uh, or increment the weight of the other indicators and increasing the deprivations of that because of that um, play, let's say like that, between the different indicators and the different deprivations in order to create a joint distribution. So it always fundamental to understand this and to understand that it is not only to take one uh, dimension or one um, parameter and to change it, but to understand that the changes in one parameter will affect the other parameters and therefore it will affect the different uh, results that you're going to have. And having these type of tools will allow you to understand better that, uh, those results. So in the case of uh, my specifically comments about the measure, it would be really interesting to see what happened if you exclude the health indicators that have a higher weight in the measure. What happened with the results and how this higher weight or this uh, uh, like the weight in these health indicators of education indicators are created like a different um, profile of poverty will, will change the results and how these um, we can understand better high weights, how high weights uh, affect the, the incidence and intensity of poverty. Um, it will be interesting to see, and, and maybe we can talk, uh, Nikolai and, and the team, about uh, what happened with the countries that have really little poverty, like in the case of Thailand, that you were uh, highlighting that example. And this becomes very really important because these countries that have poverty rates that are less than 10% or 5%, it becomes quite tricky to see what's the perfect balance between the different indicators and the different deprivation cutoffs, and how you can play with that in order to be sure that the measure that you are having, even though it's capturing a, a small percentage of people, is capturing the people who are really poor, according to your definition. And also, uh, it will be good to, to see and learn a little bit better um, about the jackal coefficient and how this jackal coefficient behaves in the subnational regions. And if that is like um, when, you, when you're playing with a country that has like high levels of poverty and everyone is poor, and when you are seeing like the rankings, you see that nothing, uh, there is no big difference in there. Is the Jacker coefficient giving us more information about that, about the percentage of people, how that changes, what extra information the, this coefficient can give us uh, compared with the pairwise comparison, and how these differ according to the levels of uh, uh, poverty that countries have. Thank you very much, and congratulations for the paper. Great. Thank you so much, Monica. I want to um... Let people in the audience uh, ask a question or two, but I'm running up against time here. So what I want to do is return it back uh, right now to Nikolai and uh, Sabina being a co-author is allowed to jump in at this point. Uh, for those of you who have questions, please put the question in Q&A or just put your name in Q&A and we'll call on you. Go ahead, Nikolai. Sure. First of all, thank you for the comments. Uh, I think that was uh, quite useful. I could uh, pick up on some of them unless uh, Sabina wants to uh, comment on something. I can certainly address a few things. Uh, so let me know if... if uh, okay. So if, uh, in, indeed, uh, I think the, the relation with the candle Tao Schumann pointed out, uh, I think that was... Uh, you, I mean, we, we had actually a discussion uh, on that uh, with, with among uh, among us. Uh, and there were some things that we had to consider in terms of the um, in terms of uh, the sampling or how that is exactly processed. And there is a difference, for example, if we would apply, or we think there is a difference. We didn't went into these details in the end. If we apply to a candle tau version and the way they would kind of process the sampling error coming from the samples, and the way we use it with a with a pairwise uh, with a share of pairwise a robust pairwise comparisons. So this is where we kind of stopped because it was clear we would go methodological innovation, which is beyond what we can do in the paper. But we came across that, and I think it's 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 a useful thing to explore. So I'm pretty sure. 
But it also it was only that we discovered this at some point that there is this similarity, and uh, we also had a quick chat on that before. Uh, I think the yeah, I mean the, the idea to come up with the weights with different uh, ranges that's uh, also uh, interesting to to kind of uh, to motivate the analysis because we actually don't want to be bound to that particular uh, argumentation that we currently have, but the idea is there is the existence of some plausible ranges and we can start from different. So I think that can add a useful nuance in order to clarify what we are aiming at and what not. So that's uh, uh, also quite helpful. Uh, um, then, yeah, I mean, the, maybe then let me quickly comment on two things uh, of, of, of money's discussion. On the one hand, indeed, I think we, we have this in mind that the, uh, that the global MPI can be a, a guide for national measures. And of course, it's a bit tricky to consider which countries do you want to compare against? because. Um, in national measures, it's like you would probably use something different. It must be useful for national purposes. So, and low poverty countries with one percentage point poverty rate uh, or headcount ratio is maybe not the best com uh, best comparison. But of course, you could focus in terms of performance on those countries, which and that's I think the interesting cases, say headcount ratio of around ten or twenty, because that's these are the non-trivial cases where the empirics really matter. If you are in the high poverty countries. The robustness does not tell you much because bro broadly speaking, everybody is poor or in the other case, nobody is poor. So there is lots of robustness, which is actually not interesting. The interesting bit is those measures to consider those measures, which, which you would apply in practice to track and monitor and analyze poverty on the national level. So that would be um, some of the countries of the global MPI would do a good job in terms of comparison there and also in terms of methodological implications that we can see. Another interesting thing kind of combining Schumann's and Moni's comments is what are maybe maybe it's a question back to money uh, what what will be the typical procedures to come up with plausible trial measures on the national level because schumann suge suggested different procedures for the weights uh, we we currently just picked dropping a single indicator living standard we could easily add dropping another indicator but my problem was at least in the global mpi my my or the there are in principle many combinations possible, how you specify the measures, you revise the indicators, you drop the indicators, where do you start, what is interesting? And my sense is, this is usually provided by country context. And this is something difficult to, to identify so easily and so clearly for, for the global context, no? So modified indicators. Um, so that would be a question back to you, whether you can kind of uh, come up with a, not an algorithm, but maybe a, a, a heuristic, uh, how to how to come up with trial measures. Uh, but maybe there are questions also from the floor. There, there are not. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sabina if she's available for uh, a response to the comments by our discussants. Yes, thank you so much. And Nikolai did a fantastic job um, at, at, at having a go at them. So I'll just say a couple other things. One is um, Shimon spoke about policy and the need to clarify that. And I think we very much are aware that there are different kinds of conversations that this can be useful for. For example, what you saw from Moni was there's an intuitive appeal to the jacquard because people can picture it. You can make diagrams. And so in terms of explaining this to a policy audience, it's a very convenient measure. Another is the results that Nikolai showed about the union approach versus an approach with a cutoff. Often people might be inclined initially for a union approach because every deprivation matters. Um, and there are also theoretical arguments um, with Patnak and Zoo or with Dutt uh, preferring a union approach for different reasons. But this is really showing the dictatorship of certain indicators um, that really um, they can dominate the final result of the measure if one indicator has a very high headcount ratio then it will balloon the measure um, and, and create an, a different kind of instability that isn't captured in some of the theoretical criticisms. I'd also like to just simply point out a couple unanswered questions to invite people on this call to take this further. One, how many pairwise comparisons are good? How do we set uh, cutoffs? What is a good enough? Um, what percentage of pairwise comparisons are good enough? It's a very complicated question because it depends on the number of items being compared. Um, and, but it's an important question. And it's one that if we move out into policy, we need an answer. 
So 65% of pairwise comparisons are robust. Is that good enough? How do we assess that? How do we really understand that result? Another question that really uh, needs an answer is how do we assess um, subnational comparisons when the numbers of subnational regions, as Nikolai showed on his initial slide, vary in, across countries, and also when the population shares of those regions vary. For example, Pakistan has four major provinces, but also some others. But one province has 50% of the population, and another province has five. So these are some of the, the next step questions um, that I think we would invite participants in this discussion to engage and to take further, because those are important for policy, um, but not yet solved. Thank you so much. Well, that was wonderful. And I, I too think the trade-off between um, ranges and kind of completeness or comparability or robustness ranges of parameters. And, and that trade-off is a really interesting one to try to get to and to get a sense of, to uh, see when things make sense, when completeness is enough, when robustness is enough, and when it's not. It's a difficult question. It uh, needs perhaps measurement to another arena where we can understand the metric uh, by which we're evaluating the outcome. I'm going to leave it at that since we actually are two minutes over time for this uh, first uh, seminar in the series. Uh, I want to thank all those uh, who were on the panel, who presented, uh, all those behind the scenes who made sure that it worked finally, and uh, all the folks in the audience who were with us throughout the entire uh, event. Uh, we actually would be willing to, uh, if someone wanted to come forward and put their name forward in the Q&A, if you want to stick around for a little bit, we can do that. Otherwise, we're going to call it quits at this moment. And thank you from Washington, uh, D.C. Take care.